Hey, how you doing? I am Pastor Mike from Good Hope Church, and I want to welcome you to our digital service. So glad that you are here with us today. Hey, I want to let you know that today is a communion service, and you are free to receive communion with us during the digital service. You can go ahead and gather some communion supplies. I've got our little self-contained communion cups here. If you'd like some of these, shoot me an email, pastormike at goodhope.ag, and I'll make sure you get some of these, you know, so that you can be uh, at home and receive communion with us. But you can also gather your own bread and juice and receive communion at the end of the service. So just kind of uh, letting you know about that. I also want to let you know we've got all kinds of announcements on our website. So if you're not here to grab one of these fantastic bulletins, uh, you can check out the website to get all the information information about what's going on. I'd love to have you participate in whatever makes sense for you. Uh, and we're going to take time now to worship the Lord. It's a time where we let go of all the worries and cares of this life and we focus our attention on the living God that loves us. So join with, let's worship the Lord.
praise your name. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, for your sacrifice that not, not only frees us from our sins, but frees us from the bondage of our past, frees us from health problems, frees us from addictions. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you are and for all that you've done. And we surrender to you today at the foot of the cross. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where
Hey, it's good to worship the Lord. Amen. I want to let you know that uh, I thank you for your faithful participation in giving. Uh, it's so exciting to uh, be serving the Lord in a healthy and financially stable ministry. <laughs> it's an incredible blessing, and so I want to thank you for your participation in that. Uh, the way we give at Good Hope is we give as the Spirit directs. We just pray and ask God what we should give, and we be obedient to that. And I encourage you to do the same thing. You can give online through the Church Center app or at our website, goodhope.ag, or else you can send us a letter. 55 Armory Road, Cloquet, Minnesota, 55720. So thank you for your faithful giving. And today, now we're going to move on to our one-minute blessing. Every service we pray together because when God's people pray, it moves the hand of God and it changes the hearts of the people who pray. And we started the one-minute blessing time years ago because I was trying to get the congregation to pray, and I noticed that we had all kinds of people in church who had never prayed out loud before in their lives, and they were very intimidated and didn't really know what to do. And so I thought, well, hey, uh, let's just do an example of praying, and then people can see what that looks like, and maybe they, they won't be so intimidated and scared about what it would be to pray out loud. So that's why we started our One Minute Blessing, and in order to continue to improve in our uh, prayer lives, we instituted the Take Five program. So Take Five is basically take five minutes, five days a week to pray for five people. Uh, I believe that when we're praying for people, it makes a difference in their lives, and also it makes a difference for us as we pray for others, we care about others, and our heart goes out to them. So I encourage you to pray for five people. If you're not already doing that, if you're doing more than that, hallelujah, this is an entry-level thing. Uh, for me, it, as far as my take five part, uh, I pray for all of our board members and their families, and I pray for all of our staff members and their families. So that's what I do for my take five. And I'm believing God that we'll have a prayer revival. And if if you're wanting to be part of a prayer revival, you think, man, you know what? I should pray. I should do more of that, but I don't know what to do. Then let me go to Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. I'm going to read through this, and then we're going to pray. This is just an example of prayer. So if you want to know, oh, I'd love to pray for somebody. I don't know what to do. Here's an example. You know, you can just let her fly. You can just pray. It doesn't have to be any kind of formula or a specific thing. But sometimes that's helpful to kind of have a template, something to give us an example for. for. So let's read Colossians 1, 9 through 14. It says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. So you see here that Paul is praying over the people in Colossae in a lot of different ways. And it starts off uh, in verse nine. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. So this is something you can pray over other people. I want to pray this over the body of Christ and believe God for a revival of prayer so that we can see the hand of God released and the power of God in our world. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. And Lord, as we pray, we seek you to, uh, to, to just light the fires of a prayer revival. Help us to grab hold of prayer. Help us to understand the power of prayer and to see your mighty hand move. Father, we pray over the body of Christ, how the Apostle Paul prayed in Colossians chapter 9, that God, that you would fill us with the knowledge of your will 
so that through all the wisdom and understanding that comes from the Holy Spirit, we may be able to live lives worthy of you and please you in every way. And Lord, we know one of those ways that pleases you is when your people are people of prayer. And so Lord, again, encourage us to take five minutes to pray for five people if we haven't been praying at all. And Lord, build our prayer lives. Let us uh, pray continually, have that uh, vibrant prayer life and not lose that vibrant prayer life. Lord, show us, answer prayers, show us your power so that as we pray, we can believe more and more and trust you for greater and greater things. Help us to walk by faith. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. God's people need to be people of prayer. And hey, guess what? This week we are finishing up our summer series. You know, I can't believe we're already into uh, Labor Day weekend. You know, what in the world is going on? Uh, this year has gone by so fast. And uh, we're, we're kind of doing part two of last week's. You know, we went uh, talking about going from the misery gospel to prosperity last week. And this week, uh, we're going to talk about my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Something that Jesus said in uh, Matthew chapter 11. So let's uh, open up the word of God, but let's pray first and believe God to show us good things. So Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy scriptures. Thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us here, again, just to figure it out uh, and guess the best we can. But Lord, you guide us by your Holy Spirit and you guide us by your Holy Word. Father, we open our hearts before you and we ask you to show us something good. Lord, we, we're all going through different things. We see things in different ways. We're fighting different parts of the battle. We have different obstacles in front of us. And so, Lord, we all need a different touch from you. But Father, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would meet each one of us personally, individually right now and give us something good. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as a new believer, I really wasn't sure what to do with verses like Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. And this is just a really interesting section of scripture that uh, my in-laws had engraved on a piece of wood in their uh, dining room on the wall as a decoration. And I remember reading it and thinking, huh, so here we go. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. <laughs> you know, when I first got saved, I thought it, it, it didn't feel light and easy. It felt like, oh no, uh, people are going to hell. What are we going to do? I don't know what to do. This is a huge responsibility to try to bring the truths of God to this world so that, so that people, you know, don't go to hell. They, they shouldn't. They're awesome. You're like, what's going on here? And it, it was a heavy burden. It was, uh, you know, my experience was a lot more like the apostle Paul describes in Romans chapter nine, you know, I mean, this, this deep anguish. And so I really didn't know what to do with these. And, you know, there's all kinds of other scriptures that seem to go a different direction than this. I mean, if I just turn the page back one and we, you know, and we go to chapter 10 of the book of Matthew, we see something that Jesus says here in verses 37 through 39. He says, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Does that, does that sound the same as come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest? This is like, you better be more dedicated to me than your parents, than you are to your kids, you know, and you got to take up your cross or you're not worthy, you know, give up your life. It's like, woo, this is a heavy responsibility, this, you know. So I was reading things like this and uh, that kind of made sense to me. I mean, I understood taking responsibility and 
fighting for a cause, you know, like I got that. But this easy and light thing was a little different, difficult. Didn't really get it at first. We'll talk about that, of course, as we go. But then uh, Luke 17, 1 through 10, it's another example of something that's kind of on the other side. And this is a section of scripture that, boy, hardly anybody ever preaches on this. Because, I mean, so you, uh, let me know if you're watching on YouTube in the comments below, if you've heard someone preach on this section of scripture before, especially the last part. Uh, and I'd love, to, I'd love to hear about that. So here we go. We're going to read Luke 17, 1 through 10. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister, and that means fellow Christian, fellow disciple, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now, of course, in verse four there, when it says, you know, if they come back seven times saying, I repent, I mean, they have to mean it. They, it, it this isn't opening yourself up to manipulation. And of course, I don't know that that's ever happened seven times in a day, but Jesus is saying, look, when somebody is honestly coming to you in repentance, accept that repentance and forgive them. But the apostles are like, wow, that is hard. I don't know that we can do that. So this is, this is the part I want to know if you've heard before. Starting in verse 6. Well, actually, verse 7 is what I want to know. But verse 6 says, he replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. So here's the, here's the part I want to know. Have you heard somebody preach on this before? Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. So what is Jesus trying to tell the apostles here? He's trying to tell them, look, you think it's something fancy to, uh, to forgive someone who repents before you seven times in one day? That's no big deal. There's going to be no party in heaven for you. You're just unworthy servants who have done your duty. This is your responsibility to the kingdom of God. Don't think it's anything special. Isn't that amazing? Like if he's, Jesus is saying, look, you're my servants. This is just normal. Go ahead and do it. There's going to be no party for you if you forgive somebody seven times in one day. So I was familiar with scriptures like that, that didn't seem light and easy, that seemed like heavy responsibilities and difficult spiritual battles. I mean, when you get to the place where you're really truly offering forgiveness to people, it's not easy to get there. I mean, that's a process. And so this didn't seem easy and light to me. Besides, all of the fellow Christians, all the people I was hanging out with, you know, they're, oh yeah, following Jesus is hard. It's so hard, you know, oh. And that's the same thing today. People are always, you know, kind of moaning and all this stuff. And, and, but what does Jesus say? He says, light and easy. He says, no, it's not hard. It's relax, light and easy. And then there are so many other scriptures that are in line with the light and easy thing. Like, you know, John 10.10, 10, hugely important verse there. Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You know, or life more abundantly in some translations. You know, abundant life, life to the full. This sounds more like light and easy than ridiculous, heavy expectations. We read Proverbs chapter 3 uh, not too long ago. Proverbs 3. Uh, today, we'll just read verses one and two. It says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. So that's kind of more along the light and easy side. And then Philippians chapter four, a verse that I, you know, try to get going in my heart uh, 
General Electric Power Company. Uh, in uh, so that uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Just trying to find my spot. All right. So Philippians four, uh, six and seven. Something that you know I've tried to. And I've needed to just grab hold of and try to get the truth of it and let it sink into my heart. It says this, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So this is a promise of peace peace in the storm, to not have any anxiety about any situation, but to have our hearts and our minds guarded by this transcending peace of God. Hallelujah. You know, like that's acknowledging that there's all kinds of difficult things going on in the world, but that we can walk in the peace of God in the midst of it. So how do we make sense of all of this? You know, is walking with Jesus light and easy Or is walking with Jesus hard and difficult and harsh? Like, what is it? Well, I was starting to get a little bit of a clue when I remembered something my mom had told me years and years ago. So when I was just a kid uh, and she was saying we should do the dishes, you know, we've eaten, now we do the dishes. And Uh, I was like, I don't want to do the dishes. And she said, no, it's just simpler this way. It's just easier if you do the dishes right after you eat, you know? And I thought, it's not easier to do the dishes. It's easier to just walk away. (laughs) You know, I'm I'm 11 or however old I am, you know? And I'm just like, look, I, I don't understand how it's easier to do the dishes. I think it's easier to go play with Legos. I think it's easier to go outside. I, I think it's easier to just ignore the dishes than it is to do the dishes. Like, I don't understand what you're getting at. And uh, then I grew up, you know, and I came to realize there's two kinds of easy. You know, there's now easy, right now easy, and there's future easy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like some things are easy to do right now, like just walk away from the dishes and not do the dishes, but it makes for something harder in the future. Um, I can't remember if I was in college or if the kids were little and we just, you know, the house just got away from us. I can't remember, but one time there was a bowl of cereal on the table and it had sloshed around and some of the milk and stuff had gotten on the outside and had made a ring around the bowl. And it wasn't until the next day that uh, I tried to pick it up (laughs) off of the table. And I mean, I got to tell you, that thing was stuck on the table. I thought it was going to break the bowl. It was an amazing seal, an amazing glue, that milk that stuck the bowl to the table. And uh, it was just like incredible. But I mean, how easy would it have been immediately to just pick the bowl up and wash it off, would have taken two seconds, no problem. But now you've got it stuck. We had to get it free. I mean, it was a lot harder. And if you've ever left the ditches until they dried off, you know, you're chipping stuff. It's just, it's a lot harder when you put it off. So it might be short-term easy, but long-term hard. And the things of God are the other way. They're short-term difficult but long-term easy. It's a short-term sacrifice, short-term discipline for a long-term payoff. That's how this works. I heard it said this way. um, We must choose between the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. We'll have one or the other, so choose wisely. You can either have the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. (laughs) I'm trying to pull that uh, little dish off of the table and having the pain of regret, you know, in that superficial example. Uh, And as we all know, the pain of discipline is much less than the pain of regret. The pain of regret is more than the pain of discipline. It's, It's compounding interest and you have to pay later. It's always worse. So let's apply this to Luke 17 three through five that we read earlier, where Jesus is telling them that they need to uh, forgive. You know, if somebody repents seven times in one day, you should forgive them. And again, that's talking about fellow believers. Um, And 17, 
3 through 5 again says this, So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. If they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the first part, it says here, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. Okay, how many Minnesota nice people do we have out there? Maybe you're like me, you know, confrontation averse and a people pleaser. You know, like, I just want everybody to be happy. I always thought, like, well, what, do you, what are you mad at me for being a people pleaser for? Shouldn't people be happy? I mean, I, <laughs> I want people to be happy. Uh, but what does it say? If we're going to be obedient to God, it says, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. So it's easier to just let it go than rebuke people in the short term, but you sacrifice a better future. If you don't actually tell them what's really going on, then they can't make an adjustment, you know, and you're going to start to build a resentment because you don't bring up the things that are bothering you. So if someone sins against you, then rebuke them. If you don't, you know, it's easier to put it off in the short term, but it creates a long-term problem. So you can see how it's light and easy in the long term if you actually bring up the problems. Now, the truth and love and all that stuff, this isn't licensed to be a, a, you know, a pain in the butt. This is just talking about you know, making sure you bring things up that need to be brought up. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. So it's easier to hold a grudge than it is to forgive in the short term. But if you live your life on grudges, you live your life on unforgiveness, you live your life on resentment and blaming others, then in the long term, your life is going to be a lot harder than if you were able to forgive in the short term. So my yoke is easy and my burden is light. An important piece of this is understanding that short-term discipline brings a long-term benefit. And if we fail in the short-term discipline, we'll have long-term regret. That pain is much worse. So when we walk in the ways of God, we are able to grab hold of the goodness of God. It pays a return in the long run. Now, a lot of us know this. You know what I mean? Like, you know, eating your vegetables is good for you. And, you know, in your 50s and 60s, you might run into some serious problems. Or if you're 40s, if you're super aggressive about it, if you don't eat your vegetables and you only eat things that aren't good for you, you know, you're going to run into problems. You know that, but sometimes it's hard to do it. You know, most of us can fall into this next trap, which is the overdue, underdue trap. You let the discipline go for a while. You start to feel guilty, so you try to make up for it, which then burns you out. So you let it go, and then since you reap the consequences of letting it go, you try to make up for it, and you get exhausted, so you quit, and on and on you go through this overdue, underdue cycle. And I see that with people following Jesus all the time. You know, they'll overdo in trying to serve God, and then it's too much, so they pull back, and they don't do anything. And then they feel bad about that. So they overdo, get the overdue, underdo thing. And it's a, it's a serious problem. And the, the reality is, is that living, living for Jesus is more of a marathon than a sprint. But the marathon is about running each mile. You know, the marathon still starts when the gun goes off, just like the 100 meters. You know, you got to be running, but you're going to, you got the 26.2 miles. You got to get there. You know, you got to, you got to run each mile to get to the finish line. And I was more of a, a put it off for now and then pull it off at the end kind of a guy. You know, I could do that in college. I could write the paper. I got to where I was writing the papers the day of, you know, I'd get up in the morning and write my paper. It wasn't the night before. And, uh, and it all worked out great. You know, I mean, that was something I could do. Uh, but you can't do that in a marathon. You can't be like, okay, well, the marathon started four hours ago. I guess I should finish now. And then you just try to run. If you've been sitting on the sidelines for four hours, you still have the whole marathon to run. And living for Jesus is more like that than it is just pulling it out at the end, uh, you know, 
So it's more about consistent faithfulness to God, and then that brings the payoff of light and easy. It's true for the individual. It's true for the group, the church, or the culture. Just really important stuff. Now, I want to get to two major points with regards to light and easy. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Two major points that I don't want you to miss. Point number one is that it's an exchange. We need to put the other yokes down. So when we're putting on the yoke of Christ, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He's saying, put something on. What is he saying to put on? He's saying to put on faith in Jesus, service to the kingdom. You know, it's about going to church and small group and daily devotions and and finding a way to serve God. You know, you're going to give of your finances. You know, you're going to take on the Christian life. You're adding something to your life. But what's Important in that is you're not just stacking it onto all the other responsibilities and the things that you're carrying in your life. There's other things you need to take off in order to put that yoke on. It's an exchange. A couple of weeks ago, we read Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. And uh, I want to read that again because it's the same uh, idea as, you know, take the other yokes off. So Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, you are taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So there's things we have to take off and there are obvious things we need to take off, you know, our sinful behaviors, our self-centered life, wrong attitudes, dark heart. But there's, you know, there's also the the good things that we take off, our guilt and shame, you know, we're forgiven and free. Hallelujah for that. But there are all kinds of other yokes to take off as well. And this is where it can get a little bit uh, uh, fuzzy for people. So there are lots of other yokes that we don't uh, belong carrying. We can carry burdens that don't belong to us that aren't what Christ has put on us. We can carry these other burdens. And His yoke is easy and his burden is light, largely because we take these other yokes off. And what are some examples? Well, we talked about grudges and unforgiveness. Would would your life get easier if you didn't have to hold grudges and walk in unforgiveness and bitterness throughout your life? If you could be free from that, you know what? Then your life is going to get easier when you're not caught in grudges. How about people pleasing? I talked about that with me. Let me tell you, a two-letter word, the word no, will set you free if you're a people pleaser. Use it early and often. It's a great thing. Your life gets easier when you learn how to set proper boundaries and you say no. You know, it's shocking. People aren't devastated when you tell them something's just not going to work out for you. Uh, It's amazing, you know? So people pleasing is a yoke that you don't belong carrying Take it off. Say no when it's appropriate. Your life will get easier. How about judging everything? Having an opinion on absolutely everything, you know, and and having a negative opinion about everything. You know, you're watching the news. You're having all these, this is terrible, that's terrible, blah, blah, blah. You know, like, it's not your call. We're not supposed to be the judge of everything. If you don't have to evaluate everything and come to an opinion on everything, wouldn't your life get a little bit simpler? And you're just following what Jesus taught to not be the judge, to let God be the judge. You know, don't judge everything. If you think you have to have an opinion on everything, take that yoke off. Your life is going to get easier. How about controlling other people? Why are you trying to control other people? That's not your responsibility. Take that yoke off. Instead, empower other people. How about worry? Jesus talks about not worrying You know, maybe you're somebody who's worried. You know, you got, you got Delta. You, what's the one that's going to come after Delta? You know, we got, uh, you know, we got. What about your financial future? What about your health? You know, we got world problems going on all over the place. You know, you're all worried. Imagine your life without worry. This is a yoke we're supposed to take off. Do you think God is worried? It's like, oh no, he's not like that. We're to be carrying the same spirit as God. He's not worried. So, uh, you know, we want to put on a a rational faith. So for example, uh, don't worry. Uh, That doesn't mean 
uh, well, I'm just not going to worry about my finances, so I'm just going to quit my job and trust God. <laughs> you know, like, no, work, earn your, earn your pay and trust God. You know, be smart about this. You got to do your responsibilities. How about needing to measure up to other people's expectations? I mean, are you supposed to measure up to other people's expectations? Scripturally, we have one uh, one person to please, and that is Almighty God. And we take off needing to prove ourselves to everybody else. And like that old quote, you know, the keeping up with the Joneses quote, uh, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. You know, if, if you're going deep into debt because you're trying to prove to somebody or yourself that you're actually a worthwhile person because you need to have a new car, a new boat, and a fancy house in order to be someone who's successful, you know, if you're trying to prove yourself, take that yoke off. All it does is get people more resentful of you and then uh and they don't even hardly even care and then you're just buried in debt because of you're trying to prove yourself take that yoke off and your life is going to get a lot easier insecurity you're not supposed to be insecure you're forgiven and free you're a co-heir with christ you know uh you're standing on a firm foundation uh, man, there's so many things, there's so many things to talk about here. For me, never being good enough, you know, like I, I had kind of like, you know, Schindler's List uh, sort of a syndrome, you know, like, well, what if I just, uh, you know, talk to one more person, maybe they'll get saved. You know, what if I just served in one more way, maybe that would advance the kingdom and, and you know, somebody will go to heaven instead of hell, you know, it, <sighs> Guess what? God is not unreasonable. Just do your part. And guess what? You're good enough. Do your part diligently. Don't do more than your part. It's good enough. God is not unreasonable. Put on reasonable expectations. Other people's yokes, that's enough. (laughs) Don't do 10 people's work. You can do your work. Now, sometimes, you know, other people drop the ball. You got to pick it up. But if everybody was carrying their own yoke, this would be easy. Victim mentality. You know, some people just seem to need to be broken. They identify as broken. And if they're not being broken, they don't know what to do. You don't need to carry a victim mentality with you. You're more than a conqueror. You don't need to be a victim. You know, uh, there's so many others. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. That's what we read about that in uh, Colossians chapter one. We'll read that again. But uh, let the Spirit guide you on what yokes you need to take off because imagine being free from grudges and unforgiveness, people pleasing, judging everything, controlling people, worry, needing to measure up to other people's expectations, all the debt that comes with trying to prove yourself financially, you know, uh, insecurity and fear and not being good enough and all this stuff. Like imagine if you could take all of that off and just be at peace with God. Now we're getting towards light and easy. So that's that thing. Put the other yokes down. You got to take off the old to put on the new. Don't just carry all the old and stack Jesus on top of the pile. You're to be free. Then the other thing that's super important is when you're finding your place in the kingdom of God, do what gives you energy. Do what God has uh, put in front of you because he's put the desires in your heart. Now, my wife, Trinette, is a paperwork person. Um, She rarely speaks in front of other people. Usually it's me and her if that ever happens, but she's not someone who wants to take a frontline ministry thing. She loves paperwork. I don't. (laughs) Thinking about doing paperwork causes me to shrivel up. For her, thinking about, you know, say, speaking in front of people causes her to shrivel up. Instead, she wants to do the paperwork. Well, hey, do the thing that gives you energy. You know, you've been created by God for a purpose. Do that purpose. Don't try to do something else. Um, And, you know, at at Good Hope, we want our volunteers to be able to do that, to grab hold of things that work for them. You know, if you're not just going to get shoved in the nursery and stuck there for the rest of your life. You know, if that's not your area that feeds you, then don't go there. Go somewhere that feeds you. Go somewhere that, that grows in you. 
uh, I was at a, the Church of the Highlands in Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, not too long ago, and they were talking about small groups. And, you know, it's, it can be difficult to get people to do small groups in church. And they said, hey, people are already gathering. Um, just find out what they're gathering over and make a small group out of it. So like if people are like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm practicing my, uh, my archery shots, you know, for bow season coming up. Oh, okay. Well, there's a small group, you know, archery small group. Fantastic. You know, do a devotion, pray for people, shoot some bows. You know, hey, you got a small group. It's not hard. Uh, people are thinking, oh, okay, we're going to go over Leviticus and, you know, that's our small group and you have to stack it on top of all the other things that you're doing. It can be light and easy. Find things that give you energy and this will build you up over time rather than burn you out. What if every Christian did that? You know, what if every Christian grabbed hold of the things that gave them energy in the body of Christ? You know, because there is a yoke we need to carry. You know, we do need to participate in the things of God. You know, big group, small group, personal devotions, service, you know, and, and all of the things that come with that. We want to serve God, but we want to take the other yokes off and do the things that give us energy. What if every Christian did that? Man, that would be great. It would be awesome. Uh, I don't have time to describe exactly what that would look like, but you would be free and we would be strong. That's, you would be free, and we would be strong. If you want the cause of Christ to be strong, take the other yokes off, and do the things that give you energy in serving the Lord. So, oh, how much could we get done for missions and evangelism? The implications are incredible. How about uh, with families in the church? We recently had a baby dedication. And, uh, you know, what if everyone in the congregation was a wonderful example and a, a and helper to all the families that came to church? It's going to change the world, you know. Ugh. All right. Let's receive communion together to close our service out. Uh, if you have some communion supplies, I, I invite you to participate with. If you just want to watch, that's cool too. But this is how we're going to close the service out with communion because Jesus told us to do this in remembrance of him. So what we're doing is we're receiving communion. Uh, like Jesus explained to his disciples at the Last Supper, he took the, the bread and the cup and he said, you know, this is my body which is broken for you, you know, and then this is the blood of the new covenant shed for you. So it's the, the body of Christ broken for our healing and the blood of Christ shed for our forgiveness. And we are to continually remember through the, through the years, through the generations that Jesus has made that sacrifice for us. So we want to do this in remembrance of him. And I want to go back to Colossians chapter 1 in order to uh, have that as our communion scripture. Because it's talking about the forgiveness of God, the redemption that comes from God. And this is the price of redemption, is the blood of Christ on the cross. So let me read Colossians 1, 9 through 4 again, and then we'll receive communion and finish the service. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Before we receive communion, I just want to say, if you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never said, Lord, please Forgive me, I believe that what you've done on the cross is sufficient for me. I believe today is your day. Don't believe the lie that following Jesus is hard. You know, I mean, there's, there are difficult situations when there's the evil of this world. People can be martyred, there can be persecutions and hardships, and you know, I'm not pretending that's not real. But walking right with God is so much easier 
than walking in in rebellion against God. Walking in the fear of what you will face on that day. So today is the day to receive forgiveness and to pledge your life to Christ. As we receive communion, if you don't know Jesus, now is your time to ask for that forgiveness, to agree with what I'm talking about and praying about when we receive communion, and to live your life from this day forward serving the Lord Jesus Christ who loves you and who has paid the price for your redemption. So let's pray and we'll receive communion together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the price that was paid for us to be redeemed. Help us to live lives worthy of the price that was paid for us. Help us to do our part, to carry the right yoke, to lay the wrong yokes down, and to carry that yoke of serving you in this life. Lord, help us to grab hold of your purpose and your plan not doing the wrong things, but walking in your plan for our lives. Let us embrace this, grab hold of it, because we know, Lord Jesus, you have paid the price for us to be redeemed. So Lord, we thank you for that forgiveness. We thank you for freedom from our mistakes and the sins of the past, that we are made worthy to walk with you, to be part of your eternal kingdom, to be redeemed. So Lord, we pledge our lives to you. Let's partake together. This is the body of Christ, which was broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ, which was shed for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you have offered redemption to us and we receive it, and we thank you, and we pledge our lives to you. Help us to walk with you in and live lives that are worthy of the calling that you have given us. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, hey, so glad that you are here with us today. Uh, From all of us at Good Hope Church to you and yours, God bless.